Hi folks, good afternoon. I think we're gonna get started. I know it's a little past 12. So if you could take a seat if you're here to attend, that would be great. I'm gonna introduce our panelists. So hello, I am Heather Kostick, the Administrative Coordinator for the Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media. And welcome to um, Climate Week at Penn and our event, which is helping kick off Climate Week. Um, climate environmental journalism uh, with Inside Climate News. And I'm gonna introduce our moderator and uh, panelists for today. So our moderator is Dr. Michael Mann. He's the Presidential Distinguished Professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science at Penn um, and with a secondary appoint appointment in the uh, Annenberg School for Communication. He's the director of the Penn Center for Science Sustainability and the Media. Um, he's also the author of more than 200 peer-reviewed and edited publications, numerous op-eds and commentaries, and six books, including his forthcoming book, Our Fragile Mind. Um, he's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences and recipient of numerous awards and prizes, including the Tyler Prize, often called the Nobel Prize of Environmental Science. Um, and we have four, I'll let Dr. Mann take a seat. <laughs> And then we have four panelists from Inside Climate News, a Pulitzer Prize winning nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization that provides essential reporting and analysis on climate change, energy, and the environment for public and decision makers. Um, first, we have Victoria St. Martin, a health and environmental justice reporter who's based in Philadelphia. She covers health and environmental justice at Inside Climate News. During a 20 year career in journalism, she's worked at half a dozen newsrooms, including the Washington Post, where she served as a breaking news and general assignment reporter. Um, besides the Post, St. Martin has also worked at the Star Ledger of Newark, New Jersey, the Times um, of, I'm, I should have asked you how to pronounce it, the Times Picune of New Orleans, um, the Trentonian, the South Bend Tribune, and WNIT, the PBS member station serving North Central Indiana. In addition to her newsroom experience, she's also a journalism educator who spent four years as a distinguished visiting journalist with the Gallivan Program in Journalism, Ethics, and Democracy at the University of Notre Dame. She is a co-director of the Dow Jones News Fund Summer Internship Training Program at Temple University. Um, St. Martin's also a graduate of Rutgers University and holds a master's degree from American University's School of Communication. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011 and has written extensively about the prevalence of breast cancer in young women. In her work, St. Martin is particularly interested in healthcare disparities affecting black women. Marianne Lavelle is a reporter from Washington, D.C. Uh, for Inside Climate News, and she's covered the environment, science, law, business in Washington, D.C. for more than two decades. She's won the Polk Award, the Investigative Editors and Reporters Award, and numerous other honors. Lavelle spent four years as online energy news editor and writer at National Geographic. She spearheaded a project on the climate lobbying for nonprofit journalism organization, uh, the Center for Public Integrity. She's also worked at U.S. News and World Report magazine and the National Law Journal. While there, she led the award-winning 1992 investigation on equal protection on the disparity in law, environmental law enforcement against polluters in minority and white communities. Lavelle received her master's degree from Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and is a graduate of Villanova University. And then we have executive editor Vernon Loeb of Inside Climate News. He joined ICN from The Atlantic, where he was a politics editor after a newspaper career as a reporter. Um, foreign co correspondent and editor. He was a California investigations editor at the LA Times, deputy managing editor for news at the Philadelphia Inquirer, metro editor at the Washington Post, and managing editor at the Houston Chronicle. He began his reporting career at the Inquirer covering the Delaware legislat legislature and became the newspaper Southeast Asia correspondent, which took him to Beijing during the Tiananmen Square uprising. Later as a Pentagon correspondent at the Post, he covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. On his watch, the Inquirer was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in national reporting. The Times was a finalist in investigative reporting and the Chronicle won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary and was twice a finalist for public service in breaking news. And last but certainly not least, Michael Kodas is the senior editor at, um, at uh, ICN uh, of Boulder, Colorado, is the author of Megafire, The Race to Extinguish a Deadly Epidemic of Flame, which won the 2018 Colorado Book of award for general nonfiction and was named one of the 20 best nonfiction books of 2017 by Amazon. He's also the author of High Crimes, The Fate of Everest in an Age of Greed, which was named the best nonfiction in USA Book News. News National Books Awards of 2008 and was the subject of a question on the game show Jeopardy. He's the former, 
Deputy Director of the Center for Environmental Journalism at the University of Colorado Boulder. As a photojournalist at the Hartford Current, he was part of the team awarded the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage in 1999. He's also been honored with awards for Pictures of the Year, Pictures of the Year International Competition, the Society of Professional Journalists, the Lowell Thomas Travel Journalism Competition, and the National Press Photographers Association. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Boston Globe, the Denver Post, Newsweek, the Ken Burns slash Lynn Novick documentary, The Vietnam War, and many other print, online, and broadcast outlets. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Mann, who, our moderator. Have a great time. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for those kind introductions, Heather. And thanks to all of you, uh, both those who came out physically and those of you who are viewing online. I understand we have a fair number of you. Uh, so it's great to have uh, this audience here, this combined audience, for what I think is going to be a very valuable and insightful conversation today. And that's what it's going to be. A lot of these panel events, you know, the moderator has these preset questions that they ask. Um, uh, often that feels sort of very uh, stiff to me. Um, so we're just going to have a conversation here today. Um, what I wanted to start out talking about, though, uh, was, uh, and by the way, let me just note, um, you know, one of the things that, that's exciting about this event, we've been wanting to do this for some time, as you can see, in, Inside Climate News has this Philly connection. Uh, just about everybody, not, every, not, not everybody, but just about everybody has some sort of Philly connection here. And, um, and it's a feel-good story in Philadelphia. We like our feel-good stories. Rocky was a feel-good story, right? Um, and uh, there's a feel-good story to be told here, Vernon, when it comes to how ICN came into being, the role they've played, and the impact that they have had on the rest of our uh, uh, media when it comes to the coverage of climate, uh, the defining issue, I would argue, of our time in a way that maybe wasn't obvious back when ICN came into being, but I think is very clear now as every day you know, we, we read headlines that really convey the gravity of the climate crisis. So Vernon, uh, let's hear more about the sort of the origins and your, your role in sort of guiding that ship. Yeah, um, so I wasn't, we were formed in 2007, uh, long before I arrived actually, our publishers, a guy named David Sassoon, who started Inside Climate News as a two-person blog. I think he got a grant from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund uh, based on his belief that nobody was covering climate in 2007, and it was this existential crisis that was you know, uh, completely uncovered. Uh, we, uh, as we started writing slowly, we've grown to about, I think we're 26 or 27 full-time employees now. We're still growing. Um, everybody co covers climate. Now, but I would argue that uh, there's still 90% of the story is uncovered because it's, it's, I used to cover the Pentagon for the Washington Post and I thought it was the ultimate beat. And now that I cover climate, I see that the, the climate is the ultimate beat because it literally touches every country, every issue, every person on the planet. And so, I think our presence really has helped make the case to everybody that you, you've got to, if you, if you care about news and public affairs and policy and so forth, you've got to be covering the climate. Thanks. Uh, any of the other panelists uh, have any uh, further thoughts about sort of the, the role of ICN in today's world? Marianne? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I, I think um, we, we have kind of a special place in covering climate journalism because although there is a bounty of sources nowadays, um, I think no one covers the intersection of, of the different aspects of the climate story the way we do. Uh, we, um, uh, the, from the most technical <laughs> issues like super pollutants to uh, clean energy and that whole realm, our clean energy reporter says there could be three or four of him. There's so much happening in that, uh, in that realm. And then, but we always cover these things in light of the politics and the um, just the tragic inaction 
that there has been on um, on climate change and how far can these solutions get when, uh, as a policy matter, we haven't really grappled with how that we're in a crisis and that how serious this is and that it can't just be individual actions and that it has to be collective action for this collective uh, problem we have. So I think that that's what we bring to it. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, Vicki it, it is such a great example because she is our writer on climate and health. Oh, I'm going to get to oh, that good, in a good, moment. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, thanks very much. Um, you know, and I, and I think, uh, you know, one of the important points uh, that you make here is that uh, inter uh, ICN um, has not adopted this frame that was all too common back in the day, back in the 2000s, in fact, even still, that um, climate change is a disputed, uh, you know, matter and we should cover both sides. What I love about ICN is that they embraced what I think is the proper journalistic view here that, um, you know, there are facts here um, and, and, and there is objective truth and climate change is a reality that's not disputed and that's where, that's where you guys start. Um, we can have a debate about the solutions uh, and the form of the solutions and the politics that surrounds that, but let's start with the actual facts. And I think that that sent a very important message to other legacy media at the time. Uh, and I, you know, uh, you guys are very modest, um, but I think uh, you can take some credit for having shifted that dynamic um, so that other media outlets now start at that same point. Start at the fact that it's real and it's having these real world impacts. And, you know, let's talk about the implications of that. You know, to quote the famous uh, one-time uh, senior senator, uh, Patrick Moynihan of New York, uh, you are entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. In today's world, unfortunately, all too often we see, we encounter those who feel they are entitled to their own alternative facts. Um, and, and that's not the way that ICN operates. And I think that that's sent a very important message to the rest of the journalistic community. Um, Victoria, I wanted uh, to talk with you about, um, you know, uh, the, the issue of climate justice. Uh, you know, that's uh, part of your beat uh, at ICN. It's something that I think draws students here. I think the, the fact that we are seeing so much passion and discussion about climate here at Penn, I'd like to say it's because of the faculty or it's because of the administration, but it isn't. It's because of students um, who increasingly see this through the lens of, of larger issues of you know, distributive justice, um, environmental justice, climate justice. Uh, I think it is at the root of the, the prominence that climate now has here at Penn. And I'd like to hear more about your experiences in covering that and the challenges and you know, the successes and the, 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 non, the not so successes. I mean, just a little bit about what it's like to be, um, be covering that beat today. Um, it's exciting, right? Um, well, first I do wanna say, you know, uh, one thing about the climate and environmental justice is, you know, as far as our health is intrinsic, intrinsically linked this, to this world, right, into the climate. And what, what's happening to the world is also affecting the way that we live, right? The way that we breathe and, um, and the illnesses we get. And right, um, I'm a breast cancer survivor, 12 years, um, like she said earlier. And I think I really started to look at it as a climate story, right? Before I even knew that I was covering climate. I also told someone recently that I was covering hurricanes, right? And I was like, oh, wow, wait. And, and then I said, I was in Louisiana and I said, oh, you know, I'm done with hurricanes. I'm moving to New Jersey. And then I covered Hurricane Sandy. So I was like, okay, this is stuff is following me. And so I always was very curious about the- The science actually shows that, by the way. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I was just so curious about how does this affect our health too, right? Like, you know, we're, um, when the climate changes, what, how are we at risk? Um, 
And for me, and the thing that I love about ICN too, is this idea of being able to kind of really get into that niche of like, how is our health affected by all of what is going on? And, um, and when, when I think um, one of my first stories uh, here and something that stays with me and that I still continue to cover is Grace Ferry and, um, and how one of the largest refineries in the nation and the oldest refinery in the nation and while it is shut down, is still, right, it uh, forever has changed generations upon generations upon generations of Philadelphians. Um, and what, what is that like, right? You know, and my, my focus has always been, um, you know, I know it sounds um, like, uh, you know, oh, you know, you cover the people, but that's really what I do. I, 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 I want to tell people's stories, um, and I think through the lens of, of people who are grappling with these issues, right, just like I grappled with 12 years ago, we can really see how the science, how the data shines through, because at the end of the day, right, it's an environmental injustice or, uh, um, because of the people that are affected there, um, right? So just being able to tell people's stories, um, and actually, I'm really honored because I have a source here today who, um, who's in the audience. Um, um, but yeah, just being able to tell people's stories and to share them with the world. So yeah. So you don't want to reveal your source is what you're telling me. She, she just walked out. I, she just walked out. So hopefully she'll be back. I'll be able to introduce her to you. It's not a secret source. No, right? not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks uh, so much. Uh, it, it's funny because uh, Victoria and I were talking a little bit about this um, during lunch before the event, and you know, just sort of the gestalt, the the impact of uh, living in a community where you're you're looking at these refineries, you're looking at these smoke smokestacks. Uh, this was actually my experience at Penn State, where I was for uh, 16, 17 years. Um, I, my office actually looked out on a coal-fired power plant, mm -hmm. the smokestack of a coal-fired power plant that was still operating, at least uh, uh, when I arrived at uh, Penn State, but uh, they were very enlightened. They moved away from coal towards natural gas. <laughs> Not as enlightened. Uh, actually, there is an effort now. There's a new wind farm, and, and, and Penn State is moving in that direction. But, but it had an impact on me, just seeing that, that, that coal-fired power plant every day. I'm talking to reporters, and I'm writing about climate, and I'm looking at the problem. And, and I have to think that there is an emotional toll, as, as you allude to. We had talked about this. You know, I went to this celebration uh, for the plant closing, right? Um, uh, it was like one of my first assignments here and I'm walking around talking to everybody in Grace Ferry and there are all lots of people who were really excited, but a bunch of them started telling me, you know, they're still operating over there. Um, they, I still see smoke. I still smell things. Um, and so I ended up talking to, uh, the, the, the company that now owns the property and they're doing a lot of um, remediation on the property. Um, and they were like, oh, we're not operating. We took down the smokestacks. I don't know what, what the residents are talking about, but it's not true, it's not true, it's not true. Um, and, and so I just happened to call this one um, therapist who specializes in eco-anxiety, right? And I was telling her this story. We've got one right here. No, oh, get out. <laughs> and I was telling her this story and she was like, Kate. Victoria, you told me that this is the oldest refinery in the nation. She was like, there have been generations upon generations of people who have seen those smokestacks. This is in their mind. They see the smokestacks. This is forever ingrained in them. This is a form of eco-anxiety, right? A form of PTSD. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still fascinated by that. And this, it, it haunts me, right? It's something that stays with me and something that, you know, I, I feel like we have to write about. And it's, it's not just, you know, about, you know, the, the, uh, the dread of the future, right? But also the dread of where you're living now, whether you've been tossed around because, and you're a climate refugee because you, you experienced Hurricane Katrina. Like, there is a word for what you're feeling and what you're experiencing. Yeah, it, 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 it is uh, profound and, um, 
I sometimes joke about it. I, I like to joke that uh, one of the best examples of a climate refugee is Ted Cruz. <laughs> you remember when he flew off to, uh, to Cancun uh, to avoid the uh, epic uh, cold air outbreak that was uh, impacting his fellow Texans. Um, so uh, what I, I wanted to follow up, uh, Victoria, you sort of emphasized the importance of storytelling. And, um, and, and storytelling doesn't mean making things up <laughs> for the students out there. It means finding compelling, uh, compelling narratives uh, because we are narrative-driven animals. Uh, you know, we used to sit around the campfire telling stories. It's, it's part of how we learn. It's part of how we communicate to each other. And great communicators know how to tell compelling stories and put out compelling narratives. And I mean, uh, Michael, I want to uh, talk, uh, I want to hear your thoughts. I mean, you have been covering one of the great stories, um, great, uh, one of the most, uh, great isn't the word, um, but one of the most compelling stories um, that, you know, the, the, the sort of visceral um, impact that climate is having on the West and the wildfires and uh, the water shortages. And I, wanted, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those stories. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, uh, as you point out, yes, story is kind of the key to the human mind and to get people to pay attention to these issues is really critically important. And uh, you know, discussing it with students before we were in here, um, one of the things that we strive to do at Inside Climate News is to make sure we're not preaching to the choir, that we are reaching out to people who are unlikely to pay attention to these issues. And one way to do that is with the power of story. Um, you know, uh, you can, um, get people to pay attention to survivors of a wildfire or the, you know, the drama of an evacuation. And uh, before they know it, now they're learning about the climate change implications of this and the relation of climate change to this. But they're really still just thinking, I'm just reading this story and this is really dramatic and I really want to know what happens in the next sentence, in the next paragraph. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a super valuable tool of what we do with, with um, our writing and our reporting and also with our, our use of visuals. Um, in the West, and one reason that I chose to uh, focus on wildfire really decades ago is um, wildfire and what we're seeing with fires is probably not going to be the, the most destructive impact of climate change that we are going to experience. But things like sea level rise and ocean acidification um, remain fairly abstract and they happen slowly. Mm -hmm. Whereas a wildfire that burns into a city is a very dramatic tale that we can tell fairly quickly. And Maui, uh, for example, Maui the horror is a, of, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and it's also a, a, a story, uh, and Maui's a really good example, that um, has changed remarkably. You know, we're seeing places burn in wildfires that never thought that they would ever see a wildfire. And I've now written this story numerous times where I um, would interview people. Um, I didn't, uh, I actually, our science writer wrote about the Marshall Fire outside of Boulder where I live, but I worked with him on that story. And uh, I've, I've written that story in Colorado a number of times where you are interviewing people who live in suburbia on paved streets with city services with, uh, you know, a big, Mount Rocky Mountain Forest, nowhere near their home, who say, I never ever dreamed that my property, my life, my, um, my family's lives would be threatened by a wildfire. And so that narrative and being able to tell that story is a way of um, helping the public wrap their heads around the idea that it is not just uh, the increasing temperatures or things that have already been happening becoming worse, but that we're seeing kind of a scrambling of our environment and we're seeing things happen in places that never experienced these things before. And, you know, other changes like flood, like um, very unusual summer and winter storms, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, 
starting it out with a real person story that is experiencing this and uh, telling that story of uh, the people that are enduring these things, adapting to these things, dealing with these things, is a way to get the public to start to pay attention to the underlying drivers of these things. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I, I was as you were describing that, I was thinking about sort of the principle of, you know, man bites dog, right? Uh, sure. Jur journalists are often, you're looking for a story, you know, there's nothing very novel when a dog bites a person. <laughs> a person bites a dog, you know, we don't hear about stories like that very often. So a story that's unusual is more likely to capture the attention and, and hopefully engage the reader. And it sounds like that's part of what you're trying to do here. Yeah, and you're, and, and, Lots of times you're dealing with a story that is a dog bites man story and you're finding the man bite do bites dog in it. You're looking for right. the unusual angle or the right. unusual approach or what was different this time. Um, and, and what can people be preparing for? What can others read about in this and think, boy, this could have affected me that way or this might affect my family or my home. Um, you know, maybe I need to think about this phenomenon differently. You know, yeah. if you read, if you go back and read climate books from the 1980s and the 1990s, people would say pretty soon we're all going to start to experience climate change. And now in 2023, every person in this room is living That's right. in, in a world where you're experiencing climate change, uh, if not weekly or monthly, annually. In, in, here in Philadelphia, a year or so ago, the Vine Street Expressway was flooded and people were uh, floating around on it on kayaks. Uh, so that's a big change from when you started your career in, in, in climate science. No, that's absolutely true. And you know, who would have thought that Philadelphia would have the worst air quality in the world because of the wildfire smoke, because of the Canadian wildfire smoke. Another one of those you know, exactly. man bites dog uh, sorts of stories um, that really gets us to think about uh, the, the climate crisis in a different way. It's hitting home. It's impacting us now. It's not polar bears off in the Arctic decades from now, which for too often was, uh, you know, any further thoughts about that? Yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, the forest stories, and, you know, people think of wildfire in the West. We've also been looking at the impacts in the East uh, and of our policy on forests and what we've done and what we're doing with the forests right now. I, uh, I went to Kentucky where they've had, had catastrophic, deadly flooding because of two uh, things that are very closely uh, related to climate. The coal mining, which just stripped, uh, it, it, you know, the underground and weakened the underground, and deforestation, the the cutting down of the forests. Um, it, it, we are writing about what is the U.S. Forest Service's policy now. Uh, we're in this climate crisis. Well, it turns out they're continuing to do clear cutting, and um, the aspect of this we're writing about is that people all across the political spectrum in these communities near the forests, they're aware of the flooding and the erosion and the mudslides and everything and the extreme precipitation. They're so um, aware of, of uh, how the forest is kind of their protection against climate change. I mean, it's literally a carbon sink, but it also is, is uh, it, preventing the erosion that really can devastate their communities. So we, we talked to uh, one of the main um, ways I told this story in Kentucky was through a man in his 30s who's a logger and who is just fighting tooth and nail against the clear cutting because of, you know, and you, you, you don't think of him as a tree hugger at all, but he realizes the connection with climate change and that how we have to do things a different way. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any thoughts here? Yeah. Yeah, um, I was just thinking about this, uh, this story that we did last week about um, Gary, Indiana, right? And there was this report, this report from the Sierra Club looking at um, steel mills and, um, and kind of 
what emissions are coming out of steel mills. And Gary was one of the places that they really focused on. And for, right, uh, for the story, you know, the scientists are like, this is what's happening, you know, right? We need this. This, this, this is what's happening. We need people to know this, right? But for me, I was really looking for someone who could kind of uh, talk to me about their concerns um, as a resident who's lived there all their lives. And there was this woman who we ended up speaking to um, who was a mother, right? And who had lived in Gary all of her life, left, went to Boston, returned with her children. And her daughter started um, not being able to breathe, right? When she moved back home, right? So this kind of bittersweet kind of homecoming for her, right? Of coming home to a place where she knows everyone um, and she wants to raise her children, but then her daughter can't breathe um, in her hometown, in the place where they, her safe place, right? And just telling that story through them because as much as the science is so important, Right. If we can't tell the story, link people who are experiencing experiencing this on a daily basis, how are we going to? How is the science going to get out there? Yeah. Uh, you remind me. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I think that's so uh, important, uh, so true. Um, we had, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, last week we had this event with PBS about storytelling. And for those who were at that event, uh, forgive me because I'm going to repeat uh, a story that I told there which is very similar to the one you just described. Uh, when we were in Phoenix, Arizona, a number of years ago, um, and it was on that day, uh, some of you may remember uh, the reports, the news reports, planes couldn't take off from the Phoenix airport. It was so hot. Um, and that's uh, in part because the air density is too low, so they can't get enough lift. It, it, the runway isn't long enough for them to get enough lift and take off. Um, and that night we were staying at the fair, the, the night before that all happened, we were staying at the Phoenix airport. We had just returned from a family vacation to the Grand Canyon. Uh, my daughter and I had been swimming in the pool at our hotel that was like a hot tub. I mean, that's how hot the water was. Um, and, you know, you practically scalded your feet as you, you know, walked out onto the pavement. Um, that night we were awakened at about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, our daughter couldn't breathe. Um, and, and it turns out uh, she, you know, has, uh, I guess, what's uh, called sort of like conditional asthma. She doesn't, nor she's not normally asthmatic, but when it's as hot as it was that day and there are as high levels of ground level ozone as there were, um, she mm -hmm. is very sensitive to that. And uh, we took her to the emergency room, the nearest emergency room in the middle of the night. They put her on a inhaler and as I sometimes say that is when we first truly came face to face with climate change in a very personal um, way um, and so and I think we all now we're at that point where so many of us are starting to have stories like that or at least have friends or family members who have stories like that and that is changing the whole discussion um, so we've talked a lot about sort of the bad side of things, the sort of dystopian, you know, uh, impacts of climate change that we are now witnessing and feeling and dealing with. Um, as I always, you know, emphasize, uh, you know, it's important to talk about both the urgency and I think what we're seeing and in, in dealing with now really conveys that urgency. But I like to pair the urgency with the agency. Um, the fact that it's not too late for us uh, to, to, to make a difference here. And I was wondering if um, each of you might have a sh sort of a, 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 an anecdote, a, a story you've written or experience you've had, which allows you to also, you know, express that agency, what we can still do. Anyone want to go first? because I'll start picking people. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> Michael. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I'm, I'm an editor um, at Inside Climate News, so I, I'm primarily working on other people's stories and other people's projects. Um, but uh, uh, Vernon is kind enough to let me escape from the desk every <laughs> once in a while to go and commit journalism myself. Um, and so uh, I, I'll pitch this only because it's a great day to look at uh, the homepage for Inside Climate News. And uh, as I, I said to the students we were talking to earlier, I will just uh, bait you with the uh, term cougar kittens. 
Um, and uh, this is the closest thing that Inside Climate News will ever uh, do to using cat videos to get you to go to our site. But it's but 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 go to the site and you can look at a project where um, our uh, California-based reporter, uh, I was the editor on the story, and when she told me about this opportunity, I, I actually was at a wedding in Kansas City, and I raced home to Colorado and packed my cameras that were very dusty because I hadn't used them in a year and raced off to Washington State to uh, go into a cougar den with some biologists that were going in to capture the cougar kittens only briefly just to give them a health assessment and chip them like you do your pets. Um, and it's overall a, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of grim story for cougars on the Olympic Peninsula. They are isolated there by highways and waterways. They're very um, uh, genetically inbred. Um, the state of Washington has a policy that if uh, um, somebody has their livestock or pet, uh, taken by a cougar that the if, if a complaint goes to the state, the only answer is lethal removal. They go and they kill the cougar if it happens to eat your goat or your cat or something like that. Um, and that has put the, this population of cougars under great pressure. Um, but being able to go in and find these cougar kittens that actually were incredibly healthy and spend time with the biologists that are... Um, working to give hope to this species, that's, that's an optimistic story. And so that's what we opened the story with. And um, that to me is somewhat symbolic of where we're at um, with, with Inside Climate News and what we're doing, which I see as actually a very optimistic story. I was the guy uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, they got laughed out of my newsroom for saying we should have a climate beat. And, you know, people thought, ah, we've got a weather reporter. That's good enough. <laughs> um, you know, and don't want to get into the explanation of the difference between weather and climate. <laughs> but um, now I work at a newsroom with, you know, 26, 27 people with great climate sub beats, climate and biodiversity, climate and agriculture, super pollutants, you know, where we've really... Um, uh, been able to get experts and specialists on all of these beats that are actually making a difference, that are actually um, out there telling those stories. And this cougar story was much that way. The overall story is kind of scary and grim for this species, but there is progress being made and we can go in and we can show that progress being made and be on the ground when you know we're seeing um, positive things happen. What I love about that framing, Michael, is that it really is a stand-in for where we, uh, where we are with the larger climate challenge, um, where we are seeing some progress, there's a movement towards renewable energy, but it's not yet enough progress. We're not seeing enough of a reduction in carbon emissions to, to keep warming below truly dangerous levels. And so, so I think that that story is almost a, a microcosm of the larger story. Um, and, you know, and just to close on the, yeah. the cougar story, um, it's gotten a lot of attention. Other media is picking it up and running our, our story and our photos. And the hope of the biologists and the people that work on this issue is they are bringing all of this to the state of Washington with the hope that they can change this policy, that as this area of Washington continues to be seen as a climate refuge and people are moving there with their pets and livestock, that we can get the state to change policy based on great. being able to tell a fairly positive story with these biologists. And that's, you know, the that's dream great. for any journalist is yeah. to have impact. Yeah, no, absolutely. Poly, policy relevant, um, uh, not policy prescriptive, but policy relevant uh, journalism, which I think is really important. Um, I've got to, I've got to see those cougar kittens. <laughs> I can't wait to. Once we're done here, I'm gonna, I really want to see them. Um, Vernon, any any thoughts on your part? You know, there's this whole debate now in climate journalism about solutions journalism, and oh, there's too much doom and gloom, and we have to write about climate solutions. Um, I, I, I believe truth is the ultimate solution. And I think every story we write and every story that educates a reader even a little bit is a solution. And we're funded, uh, we're nonpartisan, we're funded completely by foundations, philanthropic foundations and readers. And every day checks come in the mail, $10 checks, $15 checks, sometimes $5,000 checks. But to me, that is a sign that we're having an impact, we're winning. I mean, we get lots of clicks on our website and all that, but to see people 
move to the point where they send us money and say, keep doing what you're doing, to me is a real sign that we're winning slowly. It's a very incremental fight. I've read your book, and I know you're an optimist, and that's great, but your ultimate, your ultimate uh, bottom line on where we are, I find chilling and scary, and so we're way behind the curve. But I do feel like giving up is not an option, and the incremental progress we're making is really important nonetheless. Thanks, and, and please do help out ICN. They do such important work. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm delighted to, to contribute to them. Uh, now, uh, so Marianne? Yeah, so um, I, I cover politics and uh, wi without being Pollyanna-ish, I think that there are two, you know, two really landmark things that have happened in the course of me covering climate, which I really began in the beginning of the George W. Bush administration. And Back then, it was said you will never be able to overcome the divide between rich countries and poor countries and come up with a global agreement. And um, it really, through the work of uh, a lot of very dedicated people, um, it, many of them behind the scenes, uh, it, it, uh, the Paris Agreement happened. And, Although, you know, it's not perfect and it's not, I, I think of it more as a process rather than a solution. But it, what it says is, you know, maybe all countries can't do the same thing at the same timeline, but every country can do something. Let's hear what your country's going to do. Wherever you are, you make a commitment and you make a commitment, you make a commitment and everybody share your commitment. And uh, through that process, let's, let's reevaluate every few years where we are and where we need to be. And uh, absolutely, we're not, we're not going, uh, read last week's report, we're not anywhere near as fast as we go. But overcoming that and coming up with an idea on how to get some sort of global agreement, I think, is was really important. The other thing uh, that has to be said is um, we, we have now uh, Congress and the President has signed the largest investment in the energy transition ever in history. And uh, $370 billion in federal dollars, but the, Beyond that is the investment that private, the private sector is making. And we've written about this. Some of the places where the most investment is happening is in red state America. I mean, Georgia um, has uh, it, just tons of electric vehicle uh, manufacturing and battery manufa manufacturing happening to the point where when some of the very radical Republicans uh, decided that they would try to use the debt ceiling this year to uh, repeal uh, the clean energy investment. They, it, their own members said, you can't do this because it, it's become embedded, the idea of investing in what really is this new manufacturing. I mean, Republicans and Democrats are fighting in Georgia over who should get credit for uh, this new uh, investment in clean energy businesses. So I feel like there is a, a possibility that this is going to, it, you know, it's just the beginning, but it can become as embedded in um, our, our economy that it really can't go backwards. We can only go forwards with uh, moving toward cleaner and cleaner energy. Thanks. Uh, I want to make sure we save some time for Q&A, but, uh, la but last but not least, uh, Victoria, any thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, the one thing I think about is I'm, I'm working on a piece about um, how similar for me the experience of being a breast cancer survivor is to uh, kind of the tools that people talk about when it comes to eco-anxiety, right? Like they talk about um, you know, in the young breast cancer world about finding your community, 
right? Because we have so much longer to live than the average breast cancer patient, right? So finding your community, living with that existential dread of the fact that you were diagnosed with cancer at a young age, right? Same as like living with the existential dread of climate change, right? Um, and so I think about these things a lot. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter, um, and so, uh, you know, and, you know, even before she came along, right, um, I had lots of years to think about, you know, uh, about cancer and about my cancer diagnosis. And when I started covering the climate, I was like, oh, wow, like, it's so similar, right? This idea of, you know, how do you, how do you look this monster in the face, right? And still live every day and walk forward in faith. Um, and so um, my daughter, uh, the other day when we had the, uh, the wildfires here, I had kind of prepared, you know, her climate change book that I had for her and some, some papers that we were going to read. And when I got there to pick her up at school, she was like, Mom, they're the fires. Um, they're far away, but the smoke is right here. You know, and I'm like, okay, like, we're good, right? Like, I, in my head, yeah. I was like, whew, we're good. Because not only did I prepare her, but the community that she was in in school prepared, prepared her for what was going to be ahead. And so that's my hope. When I think of optimism in all the face of all this, I think of building those communities. And, and yeah, like, with the way that uh, Philly Thrive has, right, and Grace Ferry, right, these communities where you can join together and, and face this, these horrible things together. Thanks, that's great. Um, so we do have a, a little bit of time for uh, questions from the audience. Um, I see there's, I'll start, uh, I don't know, uh, Heather, if you want to uh, do the uh, question, uh, you've got a, a mic there for people. I, um, so question right here, yeah. Thank you all, this has been a wonderful panel. There is a vast array of media sources um, to get news about the climate crisis. And I'm wondering, where, where do you all see Inside Climate News fitting in there? I get the email, um, but are you, are you like a source for other media outlets, or are you primarily writing for um, individuals? This sounds like a question for Vernon. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think we're both. I mean, I think we're sort of a media influencer in, in some sense. I think we're read by a lot of uh, climate scientists and other climate journalists, but primarily we write for a general audience. Um, I, I think we have a kind of, I think our audience probably skews toward the wonky, uh, uh, but I think we, worse. <laughs> yeah, we, but we endeavor to write for a general audience and you know, educate as many as many people as we can. We don't want to preach to the choir. You know, we don't want to just write for climate heads and people who agree with us. Uh, we want to. We're we're working hard in places like it, you know, t Texas, and, and we just hired a reporter in Alabama, for example, um, because uh, funders in Alabama want our journalism in Alabama to try to sw you know to move the people who aren't in the choir. So I think so. The answer is both. <laughs> Also, I'll point out that we have a very uh, vibrant, uh, what we call a regional reporting network. And so our stories appear in lots of other publications, everything from NPR and NBC News and ABC News to little weekly newspapers. We'll partner with anybody and we will let any other publication that meets basic journalist, journalistic standards run our stories. Yeah. And, and we're doing a lot of work in Pennsylvania, particularly Western Pennsylvania about fracking. A couple of quick facts. Pennsylvania is the number two gas state uh, in America after Texas. It has, uh, I think, the second highest carbon footprint of any state after Texas. We're consuming hundreds of millions of gallons of water in Pennsylvania and making them a uh, toxic and poison forever uh, via the fracking process, which is something we're writing about right now in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so it's, he it's here and now, folks. Uh, we had a qu did we have a question back there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Super interesting. I was wondering, so I've been working a lot on communication in Haiti, in Afghanistan, in West Africa. So those places that are usually out of sight, out of mind. And I was wondering, in your experience covering climate change, do you think that this might be one of those phenomena that 
helps to reframe the whole thing as something like, well, we're in this together, because what's happening here makes an impact in Port-au-Prince. Something that's happening here is going to affect the people in Congo, but also vice versa. So maybe this is a reminder, a bit similar to COVID, but maybe even more strikingly so. That yeah, it, this it, it's very interesting. It, I mean, similar to COVID, it can go two ways. <laughs> it can go, yes, we're all in this together and we all have to work together. But unfortunately, as we experience with COVID, it also uh, would tear people apart. And um, it, it, we've definitely experienced that with climate. It still is a big factor in our politics is, well, we can't do anything until China uh, cleans up its act. And if these two big, the largest polluters uh, are just waiting on this, in this standoff for the other one, to, uh, to act will we'll just be at a stasis. So that's, uh, I have to say, um, it, it's going to kind of take leadership to make sure that it doesn't tear us apart more. Uh, and, and there are some people, <laughs> politicians who use it to help tear people apart rather than to bring people together. Yeah, I mean, we live in such a polarized media environment today that, that, that that's a challenge, I think, for everybody in this space. Um, there was a question here? here. Oh, oh yeah. here? And then, yeah. And then. Um, so there are, like, a lot of feelings and sentiments connected to the climate crisis. There's uh, climate anxiety, um, there's hope and community, and then also you were talking about the fact that some people will only take the climate crisis seriously if it affects the personal property, for instance. So I was wondering, how do you find the right tone between being drastic enough to be taken seriously and at the same time not getting into like a hopeless, oh, the world is going to end mode, which um, can be a feeling as well. Like, how do you find the right tone and the balance between that? Victoria? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's toughy. Um, I think, you know, laying it out, telling what the science is saying, right? Um, you know, and just, and balancing it. And then also making sure that, you know, the stories that we're telling, that they're based in science, right? Because sometimes, like, we talk to people who, yeah, may overblow things a bit, but, right, making sure that we're balanced just, just like in any, any other, with any other story, right? Right? Like, um, you know, yes, we're covering the climate, but, like, right, if I was covering... Uh, a shooting in Philadelphia, right? Like making sure that it's as balanced as possible, right? Um, and has all of the facts and all and everything that happened and laying it all out and not not overblowing the issue. But yeah, yeah. The, I think that our process also uh, is really helpful because we we never just write something <laughs> and put it up online. It goes through at least two. Um, two levels of editors who are coming to this subject completely new uh, often will ask, ask a colleague, if I'm writing about health, I would ask Victoria to take a look. I ask other colleagues to look at my stories to make sure that, oh, you're, you're not turning people off, but what about this? And th that's just the incredible process of editing and that's that's why you know really quality journalism outlets uh, uh, are involved in that process so they're they're not um, just uh, going off the cuff uh, and uh, really uh, looking carefully at the balance and accuracy of what they're writing thank you I'll add just that um, that we do try to cover the wins as well and so, you know, there, you know, we are seeing great successes in the climate space and particularly say our, you know, our, our clean energy writer um, is terrific. And, you know, the technological advances and, and the things that actually are working, you know, we cover those too. So, uh, you know, and I, and I think that's really important, you know, that the, there's a lot of hope out there. Great. Um, was there another question here? Yeah. yeah this one. Hi. I run a nonprofit news website called smallbizphilly.com, and I was just, well, I have two questions. So my first question is, um, 
what can small business owners do to help with climate change and help with the environment as far as being a, uh, I guess, like a mom and pop, brick and mortar, small business? That's my first question. Hmm. Any thoughts? Well, well, I think that there is a lot of assistance and uh, money available now for helping to transition to cleaner energy sources. And um, it, I, I believe that there are even centers uh, around the country that are being established to help small businesses and to help community, small community groups apply for some of these grants to help them. But uh, there's a lot more assistance out there and uh, the, you know, the key is to try to make those connections to find out um, how to get uh, that money and support. Also, I'll, I'll just say exist mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. by being a small business where I can walk over to a small business and do my shopping rather than have Amazon bring me mm -hmm. another big box with a bunch right. of emissions. You're right. doing something to help the climate. So, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, supporting the small um, local economy in itself is uh, is you know good for the climate. Great, thank you. Uh, any? Uh, do we have any online? Uh, okay. Uh, do we have maybe one one last question back? The, the lady in the yellow. I think you had a follow up, right? Oh, oh, oh okay. Um, just uh, someone had mentioned um, paraphrasing like uh, truth news, like you know the the I paraphrase something like you know the solutions is. Is truth news like how can we, as a society, verify that the news that the the, me, the, the media is projecting to to us is, is truth and, and not lies? Well, I'm I'm going to have to assert uh, moderator's privilege and address this one directly because I we are in the home uh, the Annenberg Public Policy Center is the home of factcheck.org, and my uh, colleague and friend uh, Kathleen Hall Jamison was the co-founder of factcheck.org, and it exists for precisely that reason, and Fact Check, in fact, works closely with other uh, journalistic outlets. Uh, one other thing I would point out, um, I, we could go on for at least another hour. I would love to do that, but unfortunately, we've uh, run out of time. But we will be hosting the 2024 Society of Environmental Journalists Conference here um, at uh, the Anberg Public Policy Center uh, and our center, the Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media, uh, this April. And uh, so uh, I think a bunch of you, if not all of you, are going to be here for that. Um, and there will be lots of other journalists who work in the same space. Uh, it's a very exciting opportunity for us. I think it's a great opportunity for uh, students and members of the community uh, to come out for that event. And we'll get to talk to uh, you guys and, and uh, some other uh, climate journalists as well. But I think we are going to squeeze in one last question. Good morning, everybody. My name is Debbie Robinson. And I'm a member of Philly Thrive, a grassroots agency organization, rather, that fights um, environment, everything that's happening in the environment. And um, I was related to the man right there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Me? Okay. Yeah, because you know, I'm on oxygen 24 hours a day. Um, I can't live without my oxygen. I have lung disease, kidney disease, and liver disease. But I still get out there and do what I need to do. But it was real, it was real um, scary for me when we had that, that fire in the forest and it was over here and to me I'm, I'm looking at mother and I'm saying well yeah. wait a minute we already over here in Philadelphia yeah. how I come from way out yeah. there and yeah. stuff so it's, it's really scary and what can we do as an organization well we're doing a lot as an organization but what what can we do better to not have people so afraid of you know the air and stuff thanks for that question um uh, as it happens i'm, I'm working on an op-ed right now uh, for uh, a philadelphia newspaper that is about sort of the legacy of ben franklin who uh, very few people realize he was actually sort of an environmental activist he was a scientist but he was an environmental activist and and one of the two of the things that he was really worried about in philadelphia were air quality and water quality you talk about prophetic um, now centuries later I think uh, he would be horrified at the path that we've followed and the fact that we are now experiencing issues regarding water quality and air quality that are non-local in origin. At, at his, it, it, in his time, um, these were local problems, uh, tanneries that were polluting uh, the water supply, and ironically, we had a similar incident uh, you know, uh, earlier this year. Um, 
where there was a scare of a, a, a plume of uh, harmful chemicals. Fortunately, it didn't reach the, the water supply. But he was worried about these problems as, as locally uh, as local in origin. Now we face these problems, as you allude to, the, wild, the air quality in, in Philadelphia, we can't control it here in Philadelphia anymore. It's, it, 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 it's dependent on you know, what's happening in our global atmosphere. Um, these problems are global in nature. They require solutions that are global in nature. Um, any other final thoughts about, yeah, about that? Yeah, I want to ask you one more thing. Uh, oh. What do you feel about, like a lot of people are being displaced in their homes, and we have all these buildings that, like these houses that built, coming from South Florida. We have all these houses about tall as this whole building, right? And they're letting out, they blocking the sunlight, and we don't have enough trees. I know trees mm -hmm. give off oxygen and everything like that, but what can we do as uh, people that can't afford to buy, like, pay $200,000, $200,000 and stuff for these homes, yeah. and we, we don't have anything. Yeah. We can't afford it yep. and everything. And they're not putting nothing back in the community yep. and stuff like that. Just like where I live at, it's all trees. The complex I live in is trees, the, yep. the Christmas trees, you know, and I know they give off good oxygen. A lot of box don't even have trees. And I was listening to a lady because I used to be a tree ambassador. And we went out, we talked about trees, and we had sentences about trees. And I know a lot of people don't know how powerful a tree is. You speak for the trees, where the trees have no tongues. <laughs> yes, and about the people being displaced in their homes, what do you think we could do about that? It, it's, yeah. so, it's so true that even in a city like Philadelphia, which has Fairmount Park, which is huge and everything, but if you go into the communities where people are living, right. it, you, you're kind of devoid of any of that green and and the garden space and uh and everything and uh, i know i've written in philadelphia of the movement to have more community gardens and and uh that sort of thing to really but this is a key uh solution we have to um, engage in on, on climate is bringing back both trees and uh, garden space to these uh, kind of asphalt uh, areas that we have we have uh, taken away, and and it, it it really affects people's health and well-being. And and it's well, also creating community talk. like you're doing in Philly right. Thrive. You're doing. You're creating yeah. cr community. We're not going to solve climate unless we create communities around climate and around the solution. Right. There's no better organization in Philadelphia, I think, yeah. than Philly Thrive, and you're already part of it, so keep on doing what you're doing. Right. And my last question is just to the whole class. You Mr. Victoria, I already know you. But will any of y'all be able to find in y'all schedule to come to Philly Thrive and talk to us? I will. I sign up. <laughs> I know Vicki will as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Also, uh, uh, I, uh, we should, and Vicki, I'm sure, can arrange this, but when the Society of Environmental Journalists uh, conference yeah. is here in April, we should, yeah. we should make sure to have Philly Thrive Absolutely. come to the SEJ conference, and you guys should be a part of that, Please. too, and okay. we would love to visit you. Yeah. Okay, thank you all so much for thank coming. You. Thank you so I much. really appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks to everybody for coming out for this event. I know we've run a little uh, over, uh, so thanks for your uh, willingness to stay to the end. And uh, this is an ongoing conversation that will continue. Do make sure to come out for SEJ 2024 in April. It's going to be very exciting. We're very excited to be hosting that here at Penn. It's going to be an opportunity to continue this conversation. Okay, let me just say one thing. It's a real honor for us to be here with this guy. He, he's one of our main sources. We quote him all the time. We probably quote you too much, but <laughs> the, the work he's done over the years, the, the attacks that he's withstood from climate deniers, really vicious attacks that try, really tried to destroy him and his career. It, it's, it's, I, don't really, I speak from the heart when I say that it's a real honor for us to be on the same stage with this guy. So well, thank, thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks everybody. <laughs>